All right, part four of chapter 20, two kinds of false prophets, institutional versus non-institutional. As we review how the trajectory of the church changed after the fullness was rejected, it becomes apparent that a priesthood reformation took place and the church was functioning under a lesser priesthood authority. The transition opened the door for false prophets to eventually infiltrate the leading quorums of the church. It appears to me that Christ taught that there were various categories of false prophets. Two of the categories of false prophets that he spoke of can perhaps be differentiated from each other as institutional prophets versus non-institutional prophets. Non-institutional prophets would be those who would rise up during the last generation spoken of in Matthew 24. These false prophets rise up out of the hierarchy of the institution to criticize and attempt to correct the institutional church and to lead people into the false Christ that they worship. Institutional false prophets. The first category of false prophet is addressed in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7 and 3 Nephi 14 verse 15. In this sermon, Christ speak of the in, speaks of the institutional false prophet who rises up through the ranks of leadership among Christ's covenant people. This type of false prophet may actually be called to serve by God, and they enjoy the cloak of credibility, sheep's clothing, that comes from having been called by the Lord through revelation. Quote, Beware false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. End of quote. With this mantle of authority and perceived credibility, they are able to deceive from within the flock, in positions of leadership authority. This is done through the use of unrighteous dominion and assumed authority. The thought that Christ allows, if not calls and authorizes some that he knows in his infinite foreknowledge, will rebel to serve in positions of influence and authority is an ominous concept. Yet the pattern shows up even in the heavens as we are informed that, quote, an angel of God who was in authority in the presence of God rebelled against the only begotten Son, end of quote. Certainly the Father knew that the angel of God was going to rebel. Why did the Father allow this angel to be in a position of authority? I have no profound answer other than that this appears to be the process that brings on the refiner's fire in eternity and on earth. During the time of Christ's ministry to the Jews, he referred to those Jewish scribes and Pharisees that sat in Moses' seat. Although the King James Version of the New Testament has Christ telling his disciples to, quote, observe and do, end of quote, quote, all therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, end of quote, the inspired version, however, alters the wording and provides a little extra clarity, quote, then spake Joseph to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, all therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, they will make you observe and do. For they are ministers of the law, and they make themselves your judges. But do not ye after their works, for they say, and do not. For they bind heavy burdens, and lay on men's shoulders, and they are grievous to be borne. And all their works they do to be seen of men. They make broad their flactories, and enlarge the borders of their garments, and love the uppermost rooms at feasts, and the chief seats in the synagogues, and greet in the markets. End of quote. The next observation and commandment that Christ makes about these leaders is that they love to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi, which is Master. Christ then admonishes his disciples who will be taking the gospel to the nations to not make the mistake of allowing themselves to ever be called Rabbi because they are equal brethren among Christ's people and only Christ himself is the Master. Quote, But be not ye called Rabbi, for one is your Master, which is Christ, and all ye are brethren." End of quote. The above passage is arguably warning against pyramidal leadership structures that give undue adulation and submission to mortal church leaders because of their supposed authority. For instance, having the congregation stand when the presiding authority enters the room is a dead giveaway that something's amiss and all of Christ's disciples are not considered equal. Are you aware of any cults that participate in such prophet worship? After Christ's New Testament church became organized to take the gospel to the Gentiles, the same pattern would emerge among his disciples called by revelation and given authority and a mandate within the New Testament church. Peter's denial of Christ and Judas's betrayal of Christ both demonstrate that those that are called by God into the ministry are not infallible. The focus must always be on Christ, not his representatives. It must be on the message, not the messenger. The thing that makes this whole false prophet thing incredibly confusing is the fact that God does, God does in fact use true prophets and give them the ability to speak in behalf of God. Quote, 
What I, the Lord, have spoken, I have spoken, and I excuse not myself. And though the heavens and the earth pass away, my word shall not pass away, but shall all be fulfilled, whether by mine own voice or by the voice of my servants, it is the same. For behold, and lo, the Lord is God, and the Spirit beareth record, and the record is true, and the truth abideth forever and ever. Amen. End of quote. The key is to be able to discern when the servant of God is speaking for God or whether he's speaking for himself, but making it sound as if he's speaking in behalf of God. Secondly, the focus and adulation should always be directed at the Creator, never at one of his creations. Called of God and Appointed Modern Revelation speaks of a man who will emerge in the latter day to set the church in order and establish the law of consecration prior to the return of the Lord. This true messenger of God is described as being mighty and strong. Yet in the same passage, we're informed that Christ's restored church would experience the rising up and eventually the falling by the shaft of death of a man that tries to, quote, steady the ark of God, end of quote, without specifically being called and ordained to do so. The sobering thing about the false prophet that tries to steady the ark is that he had been previously, quote, called of God and appointed, end of quote. Quote, and it shall come to pass that I, the Lord God, will send one mighty and strong, holding the scepter of power in his hand, clothed with light for a covering, whose mouth shall utter words, eternal words, while his bowels shall be a fountain of truth to set in order the house of God, and to arrange by lot the inheritances of the saints whose names are found, and the names of their fathers and their children enrolled in the book of the law of God, while that man, who was called of God and appointed, and putteth forth his hand to steady the ark of God, shall fall by the shaft of death, like as a tree that is smitten by the vivid shaft of lightning." End of quote. It's truly remarkable that there could be false prophets in the end times that have indeed been called of God and appointed. It's difficult to not think of the LDS succession crisis in the context of the above prophecy. Brigham Young's calling an appointment by God to bear witness of the name of Christ and to publish the gospel to the nations was eventually followed by his own claim to the presidency of the church. And yet his calling and appointment never appears to incorporate the role of presiding over a church. Was he not called of God and appointed? Yes, he was. Was he ever called and ordained to be a prophet, seer, and revelator, and to preside over the high priesthood of the church? No. High priesthood and the church? No. Interestingly, Brigham and his best friend and fellow Masonic brother, Heber C. Kimball, were probably the only two members of the original twelve that were never ordained high priests. At the time of the succession crisis, he initially claimed that the twelve would be a temporary placeholder to preside over the church until Joseph Smith's sons would repent and prepare themselves to preside over the church. Within three and a half years after that, he had the quorum of the First Presidency reestablished and had himself voted in by the law of common consent as the presiding officer of the First Presidency of the church still claiming to be a temporary shepherd to oversee the flock and to keep the dogs and wolves out until the rightful son of Joseph should be ready to fill the position. In 1960, he made the following declaration, stating that he did not claim to be the legal successor to Joseph Smith. Quote, what of Joseph Smith's family? What of his boys? I've prayed from the beginning for Sister Emma and for the whole family. There's not a man in this church that has entertained better feelings towards them. Joseph said to me, God will take care of my children, and I am taken. They are in the hands of God, and when they make their appearance before this people full of his power, there are none but will say, Amen, we are ready to receive you. The brethren testify that Brother Brigham is Brother Joseph's legal successor. You never heard me say so. I say that I am a good hand to keep the dogs and wolves out of the flock. I do not care a groat who rises up. I do not think anything about being Joseph's successor. End of quote. Clearly, Brigham acknowledges that he was not Bri Lo Joseph's legal successor. As the years passed, Joseph's sons became a non-issue with regard to ever presiding over the Utah Saints. During this time, the collective memory of the Utah Saints regarding the succession crisis began to dim, as Brigham became bolder in claiming the revelatory powers of a prophet. He eventually claimed that all of his sermons qualified as scripture. Quote, I say now, when they, brackets, his discourses, end of bracket, are copied and approved by me, they are as good as scripture as is couched in the Bible, end of quote. 
I know just as well what to teach this people and just what to say to them and what to do in order to bring them into the celestial kingdom. I've never yet preached a sermon and sent it out to the children of men that they may not call scripture. Let me have the privilege of correcting a sermon and it is, it is as good scripture as they deserve. The people have the oracles of God continually. End of quote. Wicked, miserable men hold the legal lease, quote-unquote. The JST version of the scriptures informs us that in the end times, during the times of the Gentiles, God gives the legal lease of his vineyard over to men who have indeed been called of God and appointed. Nevertheless, these temporary stewards are characterized as, quote, miserable, wicked men, end of quote, who will be destroyed when the Lord and his servants return to the vineyard for the last time and the legal lease will be given again to the profitable servants that will bring forth fruit. Quote, and when the Lord thereof, therefore of the vineyard cometh, he will destroy those miserable wicked men, and will let, brackets, lease, end of bracket, again his vineyard unto other husbandmen, even in the last days, who shall render him the fruits in their seasons. End of quote. From Brigham Young to Thomas Monson, we have a long line of apostles who have been called and appointed by God, they held the legal lease of the vineyard. These apostolic servants have assumed that their calling incorporates the right to organize and preside over the Lord's church and to officiate in the saving ordinances of the gospel. But is that true? Can that be documented in the scriptures and the history of the church? Under the same apostolic authority that Brigham Young and his fellow apostles held, there's been a continuous succession of apostolic leaders that have presided over the church for the last four generations since the martyrdom of the prophet Joseph Smith. The first presidency of the church and the Quorum of the Twelve constitute the 15 men, apostles, that preside over the modern corporate church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. All of these men appear to have been ordained by the same apostolic authority and mandate that God gave to the Quorum of the Twelve during Joseph Smith's ministry. But what exactly was the authority and commission that Brigham and the other apostles received? Before we investigate the answer to that question, we need to visit a prophetic event that provides historical context. Times, time, and the dividing of time. One of the most prophetically significant less yet least understood events of the LDS Restoration Movement had to do with the literal fulfillment of Christ's prophecy in 3 Nephi 16, wherein he foretold the taking of the knowledge of the fullness of the gospel to the house of Israel after the restored Gentile church rejects the fullness. In order to comprehend how this amazing prophetic event took place during Joseph's ministry, we need to understand the fulfillment of another amazing prophecy. It's not a coincidence that it was exactly three and a half years to the day from the time the Melchizedek priesthood was restored at the Morley Farm until the Lord declared that the leaders and members of the restored church were condemned, resulting in the fullness of the gospel slash priesthood being rejected. That prophetic three and a half year time sequence is referred to both in the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel. And we have a chart here that you can peruse about the sweet spot, the three and a half years from June of 1831 at the Morley Farm through December 1834 when the church was rejected. It's because of the rejection of the fullness that the elders of the restored church did not go forth for the last time preaching the gospel in power following the solemn assembly and anticipated endowment in the Kirtland Temple. Nevertheless, a little over a year after the bewildering disappointment that followed the solemn assembly, Joseph Smith made a startling declaration to the saints while they were yet in the midst of apostasy and turmoil. Once again, let us review the fact that in 1837, Joseph Smith announced that something new must be done for the salvation of the church. Quote, in this state of things, and but a few weeks before the twelve were expecting to meet in full quorum, some of them having been absent for some time, God revealed to me that something new must be done for the salvation of his church. And on or about the 1st of June, 1837, Heber C. Kimball, one of the twelve, was set apart by the spirit of prophecy and revelation, prayer and laying on of hands of the First Presidency, to preside over a mission to England, to be the first foreign mission of the Church of Christ in the last days. End of quote. The something new that had to be done for the salvation of the church was different from the previous commission of going into the world with power and authority baptizing every creature. This new commission would be different. The establishment of a foreign mission in England was the literal beginning of the fulfillment of the prophecy of Jesus Christ in 3 Nephi 16. Quote, and thus commandeth the Father that I should say unto you, 
at that day when the Gentiles shall sin against my gospel and shall reject the fullness of my gospel, behold, saith the Father, I will bring the fullness of my gospel from among them. And then will I remember my covenant which I have made unto my people of the house of Israel, and I'll bring my gospel unto them. I will remember my covenant unto you, O house of Israel, and ye shall come into the knowledge of the fullness of my gospel. End of quote. It's truly remarkable that after the Gentile church rejected the fullness of the gospel in Kirtland in 1834 by rejecting the fullness of the priesthood and failing in their covenant of consecration, the Lord brought the fullness from among them and began making preparations to have the, quote, knowledge of the fullness of the gospel, end of quote, taken to the house of Israel. The nature of the authority of the quorum of the twelve apostles who were to take the knowledge of the fullness of the gospel to the house of Israel was clearly stated by the Lord in section 112. For verily I say unto you, the keys of the dispensation which ye have received have come down from the fathers, and last of all, being sent down from heaven unto you. End of quote. What dispensation from the fathers? The Lord was clearly making reference to the secret ushering in of the dispensation of the gospel of Abraham that had previously taken place in the Kirtland Temple on April 3rd of 1836. The fathers spoken of in the above passage clearly refer to Abraham and Moses, who secretly visited Joseph and Oliver and gave them the priesthood keys from the Old Testament fathers pertaining to Latter-day Israel. This is the patriarchal priesthood authority by which the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles were commissioned to take the knowledge of the fullness of the house of Israel. This event represented the promise God made to Abraham, and he and his posterity would be a blessing to the nations of the world. How? by taking the knowledge of the fullness of the gospel to them in preparation of the return of the Lord and his servants back into the vineyard. In July of 1838, the Lord commanded the original members of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, who had fallen, to be replaced with the following four elders, who, along with other members of the Quorum that would eventually heed the call, were very possibly from the house of Israel, rather than being classified among being the believing Gentiles. John Taylor, Johnny Page, Wilford Woodruff Willard Richards. In this mind-blowing revelation, the Lord gives a very singular and limited commission to the Twelve Apostles, which surprisingly consists of two solitary themes. One, promulgate or publish the fullness of the gospel. Two, bear record of the name of Christ. Please read the following revelation very carefully, noting what priesthood gifts, power, authorities, and mandates they were and were not given beginning in the spring of that year when they crossed the great waters. Quote, Verily thus saith the Lord, Let a conference be held immediately, let the twelve be organized, and let men be appointed to supply the place of those who are fallen. Let my servant Thomas remain for a season in the land of Zion to publish my word. Let the residue continue to preach from that hour. And if they will do this in all lowliness of heart, in meekness and humility and long suffering, I, the Lord, give unto them a promise that I will provide for their families, and an effectual door shall be opened for them from henceforth. And next spring let them depart, go over the great waters, and there promulgate my gospel in fullness thereof, and bear record of my name. Let them take leave of my saints in the city of Far West on the twenty-sixth day of April next, on the building spot of my house, saith the Lord. Let my servant John Taylor, and also my servant Johnny Page, and also my servant Wilford Woodruff, and also my servant Willard Richards, be appointed to fill the places of those who have fallen, and be officially notified of their appointment. End of quote. Again, here's the long list of priesthood gifts, power, authorities, and mandates that this mission over the great waters should consist of. 1. Promulgate, publish the fullness of the gospel. 2. Bear record in the name of Christ. Please notice the word promulgate essentially means publish and perhaps to a smaller degree, promote. What is missing in the mandate is the commission to baptize, ordain, organize churches, preside, rule, judge, collect tithing money, or do anything else. Absolutely nothing is mentioned about administering the saving ordinances of the gospel. The commission given in section 118 differs drastically from the commission that had been given to some of the members of the Quorum of the Twelve back in 1831. When the fullness of the gospel was on the earth, long before they had been called, to the Quorum of the Twelve. At that time, the fullness of the gospel had not yet been rejected, and therefore, authority to officiate in the saving ordinances, speak scripture by the power of the Holy Ghost and witness of Christ, rather than just of his name, was part of their commission and mandate. Quote, 
My servant, Orson Hyde, was called by his ordination to proclaim the everlasting gospel by the Spirit of the living God, from people to people and from land to land, in the congregations of the wicked, in their synagogues, reasoning with and expounding all scriptures unto them. And behold and lo, this is an ensample unto all those who are ordained unto this priesthood, whose missions appointed unto them to go forth. And this is the ensample unto them, that they shall speak as they are moved upon by the Holy Ghost. And whatsoever they shall speak when moved upon by the Holy Ghost shall be scripture, shall be the will of the Lord, shall be the mind of the Lord, shall be the word of the Lord, shall be the voice of the Lord, and the power of, the, of God unto salvation. Behold, this is the promise of the Lord unto you, O ye my servants. Wherefore, be of good cheer, and do not fear, for I the Lord am with you, and will stand by you, and ye shall bear record of me, even Jesus Christ, that I am the Son of the living God, that I was that I am, and that I am to come. This is the word of the Lord unto you, my servant Orson Hyde, and also unto my servant Luke Johnson, and unto my servant Lyman Johnson, and unto my servant William E. McClellan, and unto all the faithful elders of my church. Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, acting in the authority which I have given you, baptizing in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. And he that believeth and is, and is baptized shall be saved, and that he that believeth not shall be damned. End of quote. Incredible. The difference between the commission and the content in section 118 compared to section 68 is staggering. Back in 1831, before the fullness had been rejected, the elders of the church had been commissioned to not just promulgate or publish the fullness of the gospel so that the people could read about what the fullness is, but to actually preach it while moved upon by the Holy Ghost, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Back then, before the fullness had been rejected, the elders of the, of the church were authorized to actually bear record of Jesus Christ, not just bear witness of the name of Jesus Christ. Quote, And ye shall bear record of me, even Jesus Christ, that I am the Son of the living God, that I was, that I am, and that I am to come. End of quote. Why were they allowed to witness of Jesus Christ instead of just his name? because the heavens were still open and there were those that were attempting to consecrate with a broken heart and a contrite spirit and therefore becoming sanctified and having the heavens opened. They were becoming literal witnesses of the resurrection of Christ. If only they would have been faithful to the fullness and taken it to the world in power when the Lord was near and the fullness was on the earth, Joseph would not have to announce plan B, quote, something new, end of quote, had to be done now, that the fullness had been rejected. It was going to need to help keep the roots of the tree alive for four generations until the fullness would return for the last time. Seek me while I am near. Once the fullness was rejected during the early Kirtland years and the heavens began to close, the apostate quorum of the twelve could only be commissioned to witness of the name of Christ. This is why the Lord had encouraged the elders in 1832 to seek him while he was near. Quote, and again, verily I say unto you, my friends, I leave these sayings with you to ponder in your hearts with this commandment which I give unto you, that ye shall call upon me while I am near. Draw near unto me, and I will draw near unto you. Seek me diligently, and ye shall find me. Ask, and ye shall receive. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. End of quote. Why were the elders being admonished to call upon the Lord while he was near? Because he was not always going to be near. The limited commission given to the Twelve Apostles in section 118 of the DNC in July of 1838 is completely consistent with the prophecy of Christ in 3 Nephi 16. Only the knowledge, quote-unquote, of the fullness of the gospel was to be taken to the house of Israel. The little season of chastisement and learning. This is because God, with his infinite foreknowledge, knew that the church would be rejected with its dead shortly after section 124 would be given in Nauvoo in 1841. This is why God, following the rejection of the fullness of the saints by the saints, declared that the fullness of the gospel and the laws of Zion could not be lived for a, quote, little season, unquote. In hindsight, it's now apparent that the little season was to last for approximately four generations, and that the little season is about to come to an end. Since the church would be rejected as a church with its dead during the Nauvoo period, the saving ordinances of the gospel would no longer be administered, it's important to realize that the saints were not being rejected by God. They were simply being rejected as a church. One of the main purposes of the church is to administer the saving ordinances of the gospel. 
The saints had lost the right to administer the saving ordinances of the gospel. Nevertheless, God wanted the knowledge of the fullness of the gospel to be taken to the house of Israel during this little season so that the knowledge could be studied during the little season and people could prepare their hearts and minds for the time when the Gentiles and the house of Israel repent and the fullness is once again restored to the earth. In 1833, D.C. 100, the Lord had declared that Zion would eventually be redeemed, but that first the children of Zion must be chastened for a little season. Quote, and now I give unto you a word concerning Zion. Zion shall be redeemed, although she is chastened for a little season. End of quote. The same declaration was reiterated in section 103 in 1834, quote, Verily I say unto you, my friends, behold, I will give unto you a revelation and commandment, that you may know how to act in the discharge of your duties concerning the salvation and redemption of your brethren, who have been scattered on the land of Zion, being driven and smitten by the hands of mine enemies, on whom I will pour out my wrath without measure in mine own time. For I have suffered them thus far, that they might fill up the measure of their iniquities, that their cut might be full and that those who call themselves after my name might be chastened for a little season, with a sore and grievous chastisement, because they did not hearken altogether unto the precepts and commandments which I gave unto them. End of quote. Notice in the above passage how the Lord was no longer calling at the Church of Christ, but rather acknowledging that it was the saints that were calling themselves by the name of Christ. The name of Christ had been officially taken out of the name of the Church in 1834 because of transgression. During this little season, we are to be taught more perfectly. Once again in 1834, section 105, the Lord reiterates that because of transgression, the saints must wait for a little season before the redemption of Zion can take place. However, he reveals that during his little season, the saints are to be taught more perfectly and thereby prepare themselves for the great endowment that will yet take place. Quote, Therefore, in consequence of the transgressions of my people, it's expedient in me that mine elders should wait for a little season for the redemption of Zion, that they themselves may be prepared, and that my people may be taught more perfectly and have experience, and know more perfectly concerning their duty and the things which I require at their hands. And this cannot be brought to pass until mine elders are endowed with power from on high. For behold, I prepared a great endowment and blessing to be poured out upon them, inasmuch as they are faithful and continue in humility before me. Therefore it's expedient in me that mine elders should wait for a little season, for the redemption of Zion, end of quote. We might well ask ourselves, have we taken the word of God that has been published for us as seriously as we need to? Have we prepared ourselves by reading and believing God's holy word? Have we been taught more perfectly by God's holy word? Or have we accepted and polluted the polluted doctrines and interpretations of the modern apostles that have not been commissioned to override the holy and infallible word of God? There is a saving power in the word. When I tell people that the fullness of the gospel had com been completely rejected by the end of 1834 and that the church was rejected with their dead by God in 1841 and that the heavens have been sealed for four generations since the martyrdom, they often ask me what the purpose of the four generations that we are living in is. Are we not just treading water with no real reason to be here? Is often the question people ask. No, we are not just treading water until something important happens. Or at least we don't need to be and shouldn't be. We have the remarkable opportunity to read, study, search, and ponder the Word of God with the promise of receiving the manifestation of God's Spirit if we believe. The reason God had Joseph and Sidney canonize the lectures on faith as the doctrine of the church after the fullness was rejected is so that we can study the doctrine of faith and the true nature of the Godhead while studying the Book of Mormon and modern revelation during the little season of chastisement and prepare ourselves for when the light shines forth for the last time. I can tell you, that I have experienced this power that comes through the written, written word. It is real. It is powerful. It makes it easy to detect high-profile people that are deceived and those that are intentionally deceiving others. I can detect them by the false doctrine they teach. It's because of the power within the written word of God regarding the gospel of Jesus Christ that the apostate quorum of the Twelve Apostles are given the limited commission of publishing the fullness of the gospel to the world. The written word of God explaining the fullness of the gospel is powerful and revelatory. God promised back in 1829 before the church was even formerly organized that, quote, Whosoever believeth on my words, them will I visit with a manifestation of my spirit, and they shall be born of me, even of water and of the spirit. End of quote. Incredible. 
Have you been visited with the manifestation of the Spirit by reading and believing the words of Christ and the inspired words of his servants about the fullness of the gospel, as contained in the written word of God that has been promulgated for your spiritual benefit? There is power in the word of God that opens the heavens with regard of being visited with the manifestation of God's Spirit. It leads to the true baptism of water in the Spirit. If you believe on the words of Christ as contained in the Book of Mormon and other scripture, you'll be visited with a manifestation of the Lord's Spirit. There are no doubt many readers of this book that have been visited with the manifestation of the Spirit and they know exactly what I'm talking about. If you've been experiencing a crisis of faith, it's because you have either not read and believed the scriptures and received the manifestation of the Spirit, or you have previously experienced the divine manifestation, but has since turned your heart from the Word of God and the accompanying manifestations of the Spirit, and have allowed yourself to let go of the iron rod. I implore you to please partake and continuously partake of the delicious fruit of the tree of life. Grab hold and keep hold of the iron rod. God has had his word published to the world so that you can be more perfectly taught prior to the return of his servants into the vineyard. This is why God mandated the limited commission of the apostate quorum of the Twelve Apostles in 1838 in publishing the scriptures to the house of Israel. That commission was so profoundly critical despite the fact that the fullness had been rejected by the saints and the church had been rejected by God as a church. God still loves his people and is preparing them for the final dispensation when the light shines forth among those of the apostate church that sit in darkness. There is power in the written word of God. In section 90 of the Doctrine and Covenants, the four the following four prophetic tidbits were revealed. 1. Verse 2. The kingdom is coming forth for the last time. 2. Verse 3. Joseph holds the keys to the kingdom and they will never be taken from him in this world or in the world to come. Point number 3 is in verse 4. When Joseph departs, the oracles received through Joseph will be retained by the church and their leaders, even though the keys are retained by Joseph. Point four, verse five, warning, quote, And all they who receive the oracles of God, let them beware how they hold them, lest they're accounted a light thing, and are brought under condemnation thereby, and stumble and fall when the storms descend, and the winds blow, and the rains descend, and beat upon their house. End of quote. As you can see, the keys of the kingdom are retained by Joseph Smith, even after he dies, so that he can return to the vineyard at the appointed time to complete his work. However, the oracles or scriptures that he brought forth are retained by the church when he dies. This is because the saints are to study the scriptures during the little season to prepare themselves for the return of the Lord. This is why the publishing of the Book of Mormon and Doctrine and Covenants has been such a critical event during the last four generations. The great test taking place during the little season of limited gospel light is that when messengers of God publish and deliver the scriptures to a new convert, the message from the LDS messengers is packaged <clears throat> with falsehoods that contradict the words of Christ within the written word. On the one hand, the messengers tell the convert that the Book of Mormon and Doctrine and Covenants is true. On the other hand, they tell them Christ's church is fully restored, that saving ordinances are available. Before long, the new converts learn that the living prophets and apostles sit in judgment with the ability to alter, contradict, and override what is written in the word of God. Some converts remain true to the Word of God in the published scriptures, while many converts migrate their faith from God's Word to the leaders of the institution that publish the scriptures. Some people feel the Spirit as they read the Book of Mormon and join the church, but they quickly discard the message of the gospel and the power of the written word in favor of putting their trust in the arm of flesh. There are actually some people who embrace the Book of Mormon without ever joining the modern corporate apostate church. These people seem to have the spiritual discernment to recognize the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants witness against the wayward shepherds. The LDS missionaries are doing a great work in sharing the Book of Mormon with people. This is an important work that needs to be done, that has been commissioned by God. Sadly, some of these missionaries manipulatively use the Word of God to direct the new convert's faith toward supposed human priesthood authority. This is because they're instructed to do so by their leaders and ultimately the apostolic brethren that have been called and appointed and sit in the seat of Moses. Again, we see the insidious pattern of men who have been, quote, called of God and appointed, end of quote, and that, quote, make themselves judges, end of quote. How insidious is it 
when men who have only been called and ordained to publish God's word and a witness of the name of Christ make themselves the judges of those that desire to accept and follow Christ. How serious of a sin is it when they organize churches and claim that they are the restored church of Christ, when in fact God rejected the church back during Joseph's ministry? How serious is it for them to claim that they have the Melchizedek priesthood and try to perform the saving ordinances when they have no power in their priesthood and have not been commissioned to do so? They have only been commissioned to promulgate the scriptures and testify of the name of Christ. Quote, and although they who receive the oracles of God, let them beware how they hold them, lest they are accounted a light thing and are brought under condemnation thereby and stumble and fall when the storms descend and the winds blow and the rains descend and beat upon their house, end of quote. Members and leaders of the apostate church need to realize just how serious it is when the word of God is taken lightly and not strictly adhered to. I'm going to suggest that Joseph Smith's declaration that, quote, something new must be done for the salvation of the church, end of quote, followed by the establishment of foreign missions by the condemned quorum of the Twelve Apostles, had to do with the literal fulfillment of Christ's prophecy in 3 Nephi 16. Indeed, the knowledge of the fullness of the gospel was taken over the great waters to the house of Israel, which resulted in the influx of converts to Nauvoo. During the last four generations, there have been millions of people who have received the oracles of God. Some of them have not taken the oracles lightly and therefore will not be condemned by them at the last day.